Bati mula sa Philippines. Sana ay maayos ang lahat. In this video, I'm going to be discussing the need for Proxmox, or my need for Proxmox apparently, so stay tuned. Uh, just got up here this morning. I was checking my uh, fermenting peppers down below. Actually, it's fermenting peppers and mangoes and onions and garlic and a few other things. It's been going for about a week now. Got that nice sour smell going. No mold or mildew growing. So it's going along good. Lots of CO2 production. Another couple of weeks, I'm going to be uh, turning it into a uh, mango pepper sauce. Won't be terribly hot, but it should be interesting. And like I say, that's going to be probably about a week to 10 days from now because it's been going about a week now. So anyway, back to the subject at hand. Let's get to our video. In this video, I'm going to try and be taking an unbiased as possible look at the need for Proxmox. I want to discuss some of the disadvantages and advantages. And in addition to Proxmox, we'll probably be looking at other GUIs like Cockpit, Webmin. There's a few of them out there. I do want to be clear here, I am not talking about the Desktop Windows Manager. This is strictly supporting servers remotely, either via web, GUI or the remote shell like SSH. Arguments about client interfaces are subjects for another time. Like I say, not talking about your personal computer, your desktop computer. This is strictly a server-based discussion. Now that I've been working with Proxmox for a while, I've probably not as done as much as I should with Libvirt directly. So I should really probably be foregrading too far along do some more experimenting with that, but I have done a lot of work with Samba configuration and I've actually I've just recently published a video about setting up a RAID array manually using the command line. So other than the virtual machine part of it, actually creating networking and all that stuff, I think I've got a pretty good handle on the need for a GUI or not. Interestingly, I find the GUI, my experience with Cockpit and Proxmox have their own learning curve. Maybe not as steep as the command line, but it is there. I remember back in the day, a long time ago, Windows NT4 days. Yeah, probably a lot of you don't remember those. But when I was building servers back then, it was all done by the command line. There was really no GUI. I think Webmin was around back then, but it wasn't in a very, what I would consider, stable, usable form. But, yeah. It's only in the last year or so that I've started using GUIs on my servers. The first experience I had with a cockpit was when I built a Plex Media server for my son. It's still running at his place, so I must have done something right. I can still access it, even from here. The GUI there was mainly if my son had to do some maintenance on it in my absence. That's another series of videos you can look at if you want to scroll back the past. There was, I think, four or five or six of them, something like that. Anyway, in this video, we're strictly looking at managing servers remotely. So we need to think of terms of things we do with the web server before we can actually come to any sort of conclusion about the need for web GUI or not. All right, let's do it. All right, let's jump right into the subject at hand. What do I do with my servers? Uh, well, that's changed over the years, but first thing I do, I've built a lot of Samba servers, uh, SMB, CIFS, for file sharing with my relatives who are Windows-only users because they want on the network and sometimes they want access to certain resources. Uh, Mini DLNA is another thing I do with my servers lately. This is a small little program. It doesn't have a GUI, so that's sort of, I don't know if it's non sequitur or not, but uh, mini, DL, DN, mini DLNA will run the uh, universal plug and play uh, protocol and DLNA, and this will allow a lot of smart devices like TVs to connect directly to your file server 
and play your media without a complex interface. Gaming, uh, mine test currently, I've been sort of disappointed in the direction Minecraft has been going lately and I still need to cater to my nieces and nephews who like playing this game. Uh, some of them have outgrown it, but some of them haven't. Uh, VPN tunneling is another thing I do that might not be considered a server, but I usually stick it on a separate computer. Big purpose there is getting through uh, the CG NAT that my ISP uses. Back when I was in the States, I didn't have CG NAT, so that wasn't really a necessity, but it is here. Uh, DNS, malicious blocking. Um, do this more for blocking malicious sites than for any ad blocking. And I like having a local DNS caching server because it does greatly speed up internet browsing, especially since my ISP has gotten into blocking some stuff. So. That's pretty much necessity. A backup system. I usually set up a system, and it, this wouldn't have to be a server, but it's basically a computer I can attach USB storage to, and I can access it across the LAN. This usually relates back up to the Samba above, because I usually create Samba shares where the USB drives, uh, hard drives will s show up when they plug them in. Uh, HTML, the LAMP, Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP or however it stands for these days. Not so much anymore. I haven't been doing web servers for two, three, four years now. So yeah, that's probably not a high priority right now. So actually taking a look at what I actually do with my servers, now we can discuss what do I need a GUI for. So let's jump into Samba. Uh, I can set this up with more control, more options, and faster in the terminal. I know that Samba default configuration file a lot of a lot of distros send out with them is kind of scary to look at it's long you can actually do a samba configuration file in about seven to ten lines so yeah i can do that faster in the terminal i already mentioned the mini dlna does not have a gui so that has to be set up in the terminal as far as my mind test server there's been some development going on or around web GUIs and things, but I have not seen one yet that I would use in production. For VPN tunneling uh, with Cloudflare, I currently set things up manually through the terminal locally. I mean, you can do this remotely from the Cloudflare site, but I seem to prefer to do it manually through my terminal by creating a file on my own machine to control this. Uh, DNS malicious blocking, I use PyHole. PyHole has its own uh, GUI, so yes, it has a GUI, and I've never played around with using it without a GUI, and I don't even know if that's possible. I also use Unbound with it, but Unbound is another terminal configuration application. Backups, again, USB drive mount point, set up as a Samba share, see Samba above, and HTML LAMP servers. I really have not been doing those, so. But in the past, that was all manual to setting up the Apache configuration file, the uh, PHP any files, all that. Yeah, that was all manual too. Another question I decided to tackle while doing this is why do I need a virtual machine or container for that matter? Why? I mean, it adds a level of complexity and they run on top of uh, the kernel along with the operating system. Security standard Matra is less is better because they through the GUIs and through the uh, actual uh, interface, they offer a larger attack surface. More on security a little later, but again, less is better. And then resources without careful consideration, you can waste a lot of resources when you're assigning hard disk space to a VM. Nobody else can use it. I know some of the spaces dynamically assigned. You can also do something kind of funny in Proxmox, making a bigger hard drive than you actually have. I'm not sure how I feel about that. This particular one, resources, in fact, a lot of these are prevalent upon your system you're using. They're going to be much more important on a low-end system with limited resources. Performance issues, VMCTs will never be 100% performance equivalent with compared to the uh, standalone computers running a dedicated application. I'm sorry, they can tell you whatever they want. It will never be 100% performance equivalent. And technically, like I said, everything here also applies to the GUI layer on top as well. 
more complexity, additional security concerns, more resources used, and performance hits. So this all sounds kind of negative for a VMCT, but let's not lose hope yet. All right. I've said a lot of negative things that might make you not want to use a virtual machine, server, whatever, but uh, let's do a reality check. Let's start with the hardware. Yes, there are performance losses, but on reasonably powerful newer hardware, they are minimal, and generally speaking, servers do not run full throttle 24-7. In fact, they spend a lot of their time slightly above idle, and you are probably not going to notice any performance degradation unless you are running your various virtual servers fairly hard. I mean, it's there, but it's, like I say, unless you're running them hard, you're probably not going to see it. Uh, most modern hardware also has virtualization settings to help with this. And another actual big plus on the hardware side is uh, reduce the number of actual servers and other network hardware that you have attached. For example, in my network up here, my home lab, I guess you'd call it, I was able to go from six computer boxes down to two computer boxes with virtualization. This allowed me to also get rid of a network switch. So yeah, there is a big advantage in hardware space, especially if you're space limited. There is a negative side to that. This falls in reality check. I don't think I wrote anything down for this, but Having the ability to create virtual servers or containers on the fly means you might actually have a lot more than you need. Spin them up, fail to turn them off later, you know. As far as security issues go, if you're a home user, you're using a home lab, you're on your personal LAN, and you have limited or no internet access to your servers, security is not generally going to be a big critical issue for you. And again, that's assuming you trust everyone who has access to your LAN and your ISP, but I'm assuming you know who's accessing your LAN. I know pretty much everyone accessing my LAN here, and like I say, security is not a big deal because these are not directly connected to the internet. A GUI is a visual for setup and maintain maintenance. For setup and maintenance, it gives you a lot of uh, control, a lot of easy control. However, it doesn't give you all the possible control options you can get from the command line. But for the majority of tasks you're going to perform, yeah, it makes things a little easier because you got a visual representation. Monitoring, this is where the programs like Cockpit and Proxmox really shine. It's easier to monitor your server via GUI, both past and present data. I know in the past, for a quick check, you'd run, I'd run like top from the command line uh, I save off data to comma separated values for our CSV files and export those and load them up in Excel to do graphs and things. Uh, yeah, most of the GUIs do this stuff for you already and you don't have to worry so much about it. So that's a big advantage. Plus, and this needs to be said, a GUI does not negate the terminal in both Cockpit and in uh, Proxmox, the two I've been using the most lately. GUI is available through your web interface. And now the exception is the Raspberry, uh, the Pi Hole. Pi Hole is the exception. It doesn't have a GUI available in its web interface, but you can SSH into the server and get a command line that way. So, yeah, GUIs do not negate the terminal. Okay, I thought I'd finish this up by taking a look at what I'm actually using in my home lab. Just to sh give you an idea and show you you don't need uh, fancy high-end equipment for this. So, at the very start, I've got this Hui uh, router. This is a fiber optic router. It's from my ISP, which is Converge. And it's your standard router. It also serves the rest of my house, not just the home lab, but yeah, it's, it's this is where it starts. You can see we've got, it's got a built-in switch. It also got a port for a USB storage. This actually, if I wanted to use that, would be, would be a FTP access. The problem here is I'm using a dual hard drive dock and a single hard drive dock works great, a dual not so great. 
And here on the bottom we have our optical input. Next is my main uh, computer I'm using for virtualization. This is a B-Link 6 Plus, I think it is. It's got a uh, Ryzen, nice Ryzen processor in there, 16 cores, 32 gigs of memory. It's working pretty good so far as a virtual machine. It's quiet. I may have to do a review on this one. I got this one as a gift from my son, but there are a few, I mean, overall I I like it, but there are, it does have a few issues. I may, I did an article on this a while back. I may do a video on it later. Next up, this was actually my main computer. It's a eighth generation Nook. I use this for a long time as my main computer. It's got a i5 Intel, four cores, uh, four threads, so eight logical processors. Uh, it's only got 16 gigs of memory, but it's still enough to run a couple virtual machines or containers. And I'm probably gonna be using this one for my file server and hook it up as my backup server, both on this machine. And, oh, this one has a hood on it. Yeah, the hood, that gives you an extra ethernet port and a USB 3 port. However, the ethernet port is ethernet to USB because it plugs into a USB header on the main board inside. And here is my hardware solution, my hardware backup solution. This is a dual bay hard drive dock. It'll take 2.5 or uh, three inch hard drives. You can actually clone drives with this. It's uh, USB 3, so it's not the fastest thing in the world, but it's not slow either. And then as far as my backup media goes, I have a bunch of solid state drives, 2.5 inch spinning drives, and some uh, three and a half inch drives. These I use for, I'm using now for my backups. So, gives me a lot of backup potential here. All right, there we have it. That's a quick video. Uh, I'm not sure how useful it was, but it's just something I felt like I needed to talk about. Because I know a lot of people, You well, again, a lot of people promote a lot of these products. It's jumping on the bandwagon of what's popular. I mean, the solution's working for me right now. I'm not sure if I'm going to stay with Proxmox or go back to uh, Cockpit or a combination of both. But there are issues, and if you're gonna do these things or use these products, you need to be aware that there are issues. It's not all roses. So I just wanted, felt they needed to highlight that. Before moving on, the next video I'm gonna do is going to focus on the creating users in Proxmox and some of the fun and interesting ways you they went about this particular task. So that'll be coming up next video. So stay tuned. Again, great for all of you to be here. Subscribe, comment, like. Uh, I'm not really pushing this channel because I'm not doing it for a profit center thing. So that it's always nice to be appreciated. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.